I think it's time to start. All right, it is time to begin. If you could find your seats, we'll get started. So good morning, everyone. Happy Lord's Day. And happy Palm Sunday. So, good morning. Good morning. All right. It, we have a, a, a jam-packed week here. So, we'll give the four biggest announcements, and you can fill in the gaps with your bulletin. First off, our Good Friday celebration will be right here. Good Friday is this Friday at 7 p.m. Come and join us for that. Next Sunday, that means, is Resurrection Sunday. It's, it's Easter next Sunday. We will be following our usual schedule. And then this Wednesday, so we've touched on Friday, Sunday, coming back out of order here. Wednesday, this Wednesday at 7 p.m. is our, our um, bi-monthly prayer meeting. So join us for that if you are if you're able. And then finally, we'll jump to April. We're about a month out now from Grace Bible Conference. That is April 19th through the 21st. That is Citizens and Exiles, all right? You can sign up online. Uh, there's some information on that, more information on, uh, uh, in the foyer. Uh, I don't know if it's in the bulletin or not. I haven't seen it. Maybe it's there too. I do know it is for sure uh, out in the foyer, and then of course you can see more of that Rockport News, and online you need to sign up. If there's any question on how to sign up, uh, get with one of us and we can help you, okay? All right, now let's stand and go to scripture for our call to worship. Our call to worship this morning is from Philippians chapter 2. Starting in verse 5, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross." Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let's, let's pray. Our gracious Father, we thank you for the grace we receive in Jesus Christ. And we praise you and exalt you as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And Lord, we confess with our mouths that you are over all. And Father, we give all the glory to you. And Lord, we ask that you would help us as we celebrate the cross of Jesus as we celebrate the finished work of Jesus on the cross, as we celebrate the resurrection, even this week, Lord, as we celebrate these wonderful truths that our salvation rests in, and, and to you alone be the glory. Lord, unite us in praise, unite us in worship, and... and um, it is in the King Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone. This solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when skins are still, when striving cease. My comfort, my all in all, 
Morning, brethren. So picking up in Romans chapter 9, um, last time we left off where Paul discusses how the Lord has mercy on whom he wills um, and hardens whom he wills. In verses 19 through 33, Paul expounds upon this, and we'll see that whether or not we're destined for perdition is entirely upon God's sovereign will and his grace. So Romans chapter 9, verses 19 and following. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder? Why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy? which he has prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. As indeed he says in Hosea, those who are not my people, I will call my people, and her who is not my beloved, I will call beloved. And in the very place where it is said to them, you are not my people, there they will be called sons of the living God. And Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. For the Lord will carry out his sentence upon the earth fully and without delay. And as Isaiah predicted, if the Lord of hosts had not left us offspring, we would have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. What, then, uh, what shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it, that is, a righteousness that is by faith. But that Israel, who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness, did not succeed in reaching that law. Why? because they did not pursue it by faith, but as if it were based on works. They have stumbled over the stumbling stone. As, is, as it is written, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. This is the word of your God. Good morning. Good morning. Herman and uh, crack team of offering takers can go ahead and come up. I'm just going to talk for a, a quick second about the Acts 4 fund. And it does not mean you get whatever you ask for. It's for special needs. It's for special needs within the congregation. And uh, there are, there's a lot of needs. We're needy people, right? And um, so you have the opportunity not only today to give this fund, but 365 days a year you have the opportunity to give to this fund. Um, Acts 4, 34 through 35, from the pastor's letter today, there was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them 
and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. So as you're blessed and with a joyful heart, we have the opportunity today to give. We always have the opportunity to do the most important thing, which is pray, to uh, spend time and, and share our skills and do the work that it takes to work on this project and, and other projects. And, uh, and also, if you've got a few extra drachma in that sock drawer, then bring those too. So, Heavenly Father, we ask that uh, you would bless this offering, bless the giver, um, give us joyful hearts to give with, bless um, all of the work that goes forth, that this is a witness to your honor and your glory, and we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Stand when you're able. We'll sing, Change My Heart, O oh God. Change my heart, O oh God. Make it ever true. Change my heart, O oh God. May I be like you. We'll sing that again, Change My Heart. Change my heart, O oh God.
Amen. You may be seated. Now, as we turn our, to our confession, uh, Jesus taught his people, this is how you are to pray, and he gave us a prayer we refer to as the Lord's Prayer, and so our confession this morning will draw from that. The congregational reading that you will join in is in bold, and so please pray this to the Lord, uh, starting out. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Seeing your holiness, we are aware of our failings. We have, even this week, sought to build our kingdoms and insist on our own way. We confess this is evil and bitter, and we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Father, we have been anxious about many things. In an unstable world, we fear for our lives, our liberties, our children, and what tomorrow will bring. We confess our need and pray, Give us this day our daily bread. Our struggle to preserve our kingdoms has led us into many sins. We have sought pleasure in impurity, security in selfishness, and identity in those we despise. We have paid more attention to the speck in our brother's eye than the log in our own. We confess our sin and pray. Forgive us our debts as we forgive, forgive our debtors. We have overestimated our resources and underestimated our enemy. Too often we have made war against men and forgotten that our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. We confess our weakness and pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. And let us continue in prayer, even as Jesus taught us to pray, give us this day our daily bread. We have many needs as a congregation, so we turn to the Lord with these needs. Father, you are our all in all. Our own resources are very limited, very weak. And even what we have may be taken away in a moment. Our life is a breath. And yet you are eternal. You are all powerful. And you are our Father. And we thank you. And we thank you as we pray, give us this day our daily bread. We ask for what we need in this moment, at this stage of life, for this day. We don't presume on tomorrow because we do not know what tomorrow may bring. We ask For this day, give us this day our daily bread, and that looks different at each stage of life. So we ask for our congregation at the different stages of life. We pray for our very young children, our newborns even, for physical health, the the babies you have recently brought into our congregation, that you'd cause them to grow in, in body and in mind and spirit. We pray for our children growing up that they would have ears open to the gospel Uh, declared, proclaimed here as we gather, and also in their families. We ask that you would give them hearts to submit to their parents, to obey as obeying you, to love their brothers and sisters, and to share the good news of Jesus with friends. We ask for those coming into adulthood, our young adults, who are wrestling with questions of identity, who are questioning with, uh, wrestling with questions of um, the future and what they're made to do. We pray that they would have a desire to live for something bigger than just amusing themselves, that they would have a vision of what you made them for, first to know you and then to walk in obedience in so many ways, that they would glorify you as they start to think about um, a life in the future that includes uh, romantic relationships that you would give wisdom to our parents as they help their children deal with new thoughts and new feelings. We ask for our, those who are in the stage of, of college or starting careers or looking to the future that, that you would give them peace and a, an assurance that you are directing their steps and that you would give them a, a desire to uh, not merely accumulate wealth, or earn prestige, but that you, they would seek to honor you in all things and to use the gifts that you've given to glorify you and to love their neighbor. We ask for those who are in, uh, in 
um, a, a life, whether it's married with children or, or not, we ask that you would give them um, confidence, that you would give them strength to keep going, as so much of the glory you call us to give you is done in the course of steadfastness, of faithfulness, of honoring you in the day-to-day. And in those moments, we ask, give us this day our daily bread. We ask for those who hit midlife and may hit a, a patch of ice and wonder, have I wasted my life? Have I accomplished anything? We ask that you would fill them with hope that you are the ones that are the one that have laid out their steps and have made the whole path so that they might know you. That brothers and sisters here in this congregation would realize the the thing that this life is all about is to know you and the power of your resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in your sufferings, becoming like you in your death, in order that we may attain to the resurrection from the dead. And for those in our congregation who are hitting the senior years and in those face new challenges, um, both in the body, uh, maybe financially, um, in all sorts of contexts, and each of those brothers and sisters, that situation looks different. We pray for them. Give us this day our daily bread, all that we need, so that we might glorify you in the lives you've given us to lead. We pray all these things. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite those who will be helping to serve the Lord's Supper to come forward. And as we turn to the Lord's Supper, we think of uh, another thing that we said as we prayed the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our debts as we forgive those who have uh, debts against or who owe us. I'm reminded of the, the parable Jesus told in Matthew 18 who, where he compares the kingdom of heaven to a king who forgives a servant a huge debt. It amounts to billions of dollars. And the servant comes in and begs for mercy, and he forgives him. The servant fell on his feet and knees and imploring him, and the master of the servant released him and forgave him the debt. But then the servant goes out, and he finds someone who owes him. And it's a substantial sum. It's about a third year of wages for a worker. So we might be talking ten to $15,000. It's not nothing. And yet he shakes this man who has just been forgiven so much, shakes him and says, pay me what you owe me. And when the master finds out about this, he is livid. And he says... You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And that man is punished. As we turn to this, we are not thinking of punishment. Um, Our forgiveness of one another is not a way that we earn God's forgiveness of us. But our forgiveness of one another, whether we hold on to bitternesses for people that really have hurt you, 10 to 15,000, and it's not nothing. And some of you have felt real hurts. And yet, our forgiveness of them is a measure of how much we have come to appreciate the debt God has forgiven us. And so as we turn to this, we are reminded of the debt that God has forgiven us. We are reminded we owed billions, an unpayable sum. And yet God, in Christ, washed that debt away. He nailed our debts to the cross. He did away with them. And so now we have the freedom to, as we have freely been given, we freely give. And so if you are someone who celebrates this free grace of Jesus, who has known the forgiveness of a great debt, this meal is for you. We will take up the the bread and we will remember a body broken so that ours would not be. We will take up the cup and remember a new covenant in which we are fully and freely forgiven. And we will give glory to God. If you are not someone who has come to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, this meal is not for you to participate in, but to observe and to observe the visible faith of believers, God's sons and daughters, lifting up salvation in Jesus. And that's what we will do now.
For this is how God loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Father, we thank you for this love for sinners, for a love that doesn't leave us as sinners, but washes us, and then doesn't leave us ignoring us, dismissing us, just barely forgiving us, but welcomes us into your family. We thank you in Jesus' name, amen. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the, this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you, brothers. Stand once more. I once was lost. I once was lost in darkest night, yet thought I knew the way, the sin that promised joy. Father, 
For that, of course, we continue in God's Word through the Apostle Paul to the Galatians. And so Galatians chapter 2, going to begin reading in verse 16. We're breaking in, of course, toward the end of a whole package that goes together as 
really Paul is still dealing with his, his rebuke to Peter, Barnabas, and the others who have sought to impose the old covenant law of Moses upon the Gentile believers in Antioch. And this is the same thing that is now happening in Galatia. And Paul is continuing that thought, focusing upon the gospel of grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, apart from the law, but trusting only in what he has done. So picking up in verse 16, Paul says, Yet we know... That a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order, that, uh, in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. But if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Do not nullify the grace of God. For if righteousness were through the law... Then Christ died for no purpose. And now, Lord, we know that you have died for unending purpose, magnificent, beautiful, completed, perfect purpose. And that is for the providing of a righteousness by faith that fits us, just as we've been singing in these songs, to stand before the Father and be accepted in a perfect righteousness that is not our own, but that which Christ has earned and provided for those who receive it through the empty hand of faith. Help us now. Give us ears to hear as we think through even some, some difficult thoughts and, and, and seek to understand how our standing before you is one, is finished and grants us a full confidence that we are and forever shall be yours when we come to you by grace through faith alone. Grant that to us now, we pray in Jesus. Amen. So we are justified. We are counted righteous in God's sight, not by the things we do, but by faith in what Christ has done. That truth is foundational for Everything Paul says here, it's, that truth is foundational for everything that he will say in the book of Galatians, because that truth is foundational for the gospel itself, and so also for, for your life now and your happiness in Christ for all eternity, so that everything Paul says here is vital for our understanding of the gospel. We are saved by faith in Christ alone, not by works of the law, so that we may now live through faith in Christ and not by doing works of the law. And so let's look at this this morning. And we need to think hard about this because there is a lot of confusion here. First thing we need to see from Paul here is that because salvation is by grace in Christ alone, by faith in Christ alone, and not works of the law, we cannot go back to the law of Moses as the foundation for our lives. We must go on to Christ. Verse 16 to 18, right in the middle, as he's addressing Peter and these others specifically, he says, and we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. But if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too are found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. Okay, what's going on here? Well, remember what this whole section is about. 
This comes right on the heels of Paul's conflict with Peter over whether or not the Old Testament commands about separation and food laws and, and what you can and cannot eat and who you can even have lunch with. And Paul is pressing Peter and these others to think in terms of the new covenant of Christ where that wall of separation has been torn down rather than the old covenant adherence to the law of Moses where it was, frankly, still up. And remember, we saw last time that he had reminded Peter that Peter himself knew and understands this. Uh, that's the whole point of verse 16. Peter, we ourselves, you and me, we've believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ, not works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. Peter, even we who were brought up under the law now understand that the law cannot save. It cannot make us righteous. That's why we have turned from the law with its commands in order to take hold of Christ by faith alone. And then he poses this question in verse 17. But if in our endeavor to be justified by Christ, we too were found to be sinners, well, is Christ then a servant of sin? I mean, we're sinners too, Peter. That's a shocking thought for someone with Peter's background. You see, the first century Jews thought that they were not sinners, at least not like the Gentiles, because they had the law. They imagined that the law, because it pointed out sin, enabled them to clear, steer clear of sin. But Gentiles didn't have the law. And so Gentiles just lived in this sin. Therefore, Gentiles were sinners, but, but we Jews, we're not, not like them. Gentiles need cleansing, but we Jews, we don't. That's what Paul was referring to back in verse 15 when picking up their own language. He said, we ourselves are Jews by birth and you know, not Gentile sinners. That was the Jewish attitude under the law. That had been Paul's attitude and Peter's attitude for most of their lives. And maybe you remember how in Philippians, Paul, looking back on those days when he was a Pharisee, said that you know, in, in those days he would have considered himself as to the law, righteous, blameless in God's sight. But then one day, he and Peter met Christ. And Christ is a better and brighter light than the law. See, you can, you can look at the law and you can look at uh, the commands and you can come out thinking you're pretty good. That's the problem with legalism, as we've seen. If my relationship with God is dependent on keeping the rules of the law, I, I can convince myself that I'm, I'm pretty good. You know, I've kept the law, as the rich young ruler would pretty much say. But once you get a clear look at Christ in all of his bright, burning purity. Next to him, your sinfulness becomes apparent. And so the law is a light. It can expose sin, but it's a dim light compared to Christ. It's a shadow compared to him. It is but a reflection of Christ. But Christ is the true burning light in whom we see God and the pure character of God lived out before us. And so when we turn to Christ, we see God's holiness and purity in living color. And when we see that, there simply is no place for our sin to hide anymore. It was that side of Christ that moved Paul from a Pharisee claiming, I'm righteous according to the law, to a Christian confessing, I am the chief of sinners. Do you want to see your sin more clearly? Look to Christ in his word. Listen to Christ as he teaches. Don't stop with the law of Moses. Run to Christ. Look at your life in the light of Christ and, and there you will see your sin exposed in the light of his perfect, 
purity. But, but not only will you see your sin exposed in the light of his perfect purity, you'll also see the remedy for your sin, which is why Christ came. 1 Timothy 1, 15, Paul says, Christ came into the world for this reason, to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. Paul, the former Pharisee, says, I'm the worst sinner there is. But, of course, that's what created the problem in the minds of these Jewish believers who were still clinging to the law of Moses. Wait a minute, they said. If turning to the law, if turning from the law to Christ makes you a sinner, doesn't that make Christ an agent of sin? You know, we want the law to to keep us from sin. Uh, You've let go of the law, and apparently it's made you even more sinful. Is that what Christ does? Is that the result of believing that salvation is by faith alone apart from works of the law? Is that what it'll produce? More sin? What's Paul's answer? Certainly not. May ganoida. No way. That's crazy. Same answer he will give in Romans 6, 1 and 2 when the subject there is that it's by grace alone through what God has done, not by our works. And and, and the question is posed, well, does that mean we just sin that grace may abound? And Paul says, no, no. Uh, Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Same words, never, no way. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Turning back to the law is not the answer to the Christian's sin. Christ is. The gospel is. Gospel forgiveness and grace is. Freedom from the law through grace does not lead to more sin. It leads to a change of heart and a new life in Christ. That's why we can't go back to the law for righteousness. Or Romans 10, 4, Paul will say, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Which is kind of what Paul is saying here in verse 18. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. Now, what had Paul torn down? Well, he's talking about adherence to the law as a way of relating to God and his people. Uh, typified by all those food laws and stipulations that, that, frankly, Peter was now trying to reimpose upon their Gentile Christian friends. And Paul says, you know, if I rebuild that structure of law-based righteousness that required separation from the Gentiles and all these other things, if I try to rebuild that structure after I had previously torn it down through the grace of the gospel, well, I, I just proved that I was a transgressor for tearing it down in the first place. If that law is still in place, then, then I should never have set it aside. And, and so by putting it back in place now, I, I'm just confessing, boy, I was wrong. I, I have transgressed And the whole law is still in place, and I have to obey all of it to be right with God. That's the inherent contradiction of trying to keep the Old Testament code as our present code of life in Christ. It either stands or it doesn't. If it does, then you have to keep the whole thing, as Paul will say very clearly in Galatians 5.3. But if not then the old covenant which Christ has fulfilled no longer determines your standing with God. Christ does. And so Paul's point is that by waffling as he did, Peter has hopelessly contradicted himself in trying to reimpose old covenant law that he knows has come to an end with the coming of Christ. Uh, as Paul will say later in Ephesians 2, 14 to 16, he says, for Christ himself is our peace. How do we come to know God? How do we walk with him? We walk in Christ. Christ himself is our peace, who has made us both, Jew and Gentile, one, and broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. How? By abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man, the church, his people, in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body, the church, through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. 
Which brings us to the second thing we see here in Paul this morning. Because we have died with Christ by faith, we are dead to the rule of old covenant law. Verse 19, for through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. Frankly, that's a shocking thing for a former Pharisee to write. And so maybe we need to take a little time and and work through what Paul says here. But, But he says it quite emphatically. I myself have died to the law. There's an emphasis here on this. Paul says, as a former Pharisee who once lived by the law, I have now died to the law. What does he mean by that? Well, he means that the law itself is no longer the governing sphere of his life because Christ is. Something has changed with the coming of Christ, something huge. The coming of Christ has brought an end to that old era of law righteousness, to the, to the old covenant with its law of Moses and all that goes with it, it, it its, its, its requirements, its commands. Christ's coming has brought an end to that era. And with his resurrection, he's brought us into a new life and a new era where the whole of our lives and our relationship to God and one another is determined not by the laws we keep, but by the Christ who redeemed us and made us his own. And so Paul pictures that change of eras as a change of lordship with these shocking words, I died to the law. I died. Now, a death means that something has come to an end. If we're talking about a ruler or a king, his death would mean the end of his reign. Uh, Whatever threat he represented before, it it exists no more. Whatever hold he had over our lives, he, he has it no more. We are freed from his reign. Paul says, that's what's happened with reference to the Old Testament law covenant. Any hold that that old covenant held over me is gone. Its threat is vanquished. Uh, There has been a change in administration. I'm no longer living under that old dominion of the law because I have a new master in Christ. I no longer live before God in relation to that law, looking to it, worrying about it, uh, seeking to respond to it. That's no longer where I live because now I live in Christ. Because I am alive in Christ. I am alive to God apart from the law through the finished work of Christ. And and in that sense, I'm, I'm done with the law and with relating to God through that law because I have all of that in Christ. Now, am I making too much of this? Or have I stated it too strongly? I don't think so. Turn over to Romans chapter 7. Uh, Verses 1 to 6, Romans chapter 7, verse 1 to 6, Paul, some people call Galatians sort of Paul's outline for Romans, because some of the things he says in brief in Galatians, he really fleshes out later in Romans. Uh, Romans 7, 1 to 6, using a little different illustration to get to the same point, he says, or do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law is only binding on a person as long as as he lives. For a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives, but if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law, and if she marries another man, she's not an adulteress. Now he's going to apply that. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. Now, we really do need to grapple with the newness 
of the new covenant that Christ has established with his death and resurrection. Uh, that Old Testament law, as wonderful as it was, as true as it is in giving us a picture of who God is and showing us his character and, and, and what he required of his people in the context of the Old Covenant era, that law specifically is no longer our law in the New Covenant. The believer's marriage to the Old Covenant law is over. It's done. And Christ is now our husband and our life. We relate now to God directly through Christ. Again, likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ so that you may belong to another. Who? To him who has been raised from the dead in order that we might bear fruit for God. Verse 6 and having been released from the law, uh, having died to that which held us captive, uh, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit, not in the old way of the written code. Paul's going to flesh those thoughts out in the rest of Galatians. So he's got to hang on for some of that. Now, does that mean that the Old Testament then has nothing more to say to us, so that we, can, we can't learn truth there. Well, of course not. It's still Bible. It's still part of the revelation. In fact, it, it is still revelation from God, about God, and about God's character. It, it illustrates His ways, and we can learn much from its example. That's kind of what Jesus meant in Matthew 5, 17, when He says He didn't come to abolish the Old Testament, you know, to destroy, you know, law and prophets as if they no longer exist as if they've been excised and we can't even look at them. No, we still have that as a part of God's book that reveals God's character and ways, but now Christ has fulfilled it. He's brought it to its end goal. He's accomplished uh, all that it required in our place. So we're no longer under it as our law covenant. It no longer functions as the standard focus of our lives. Why? Because we have a better standard. We have Christ himself in whom we see a better glory, as Hebrews says. And so we're no longer under the old covenant as our law uh, by which we relate to God. We died to that. Now we live in the brighter light of the finished work of Christ. Now our lives are governed not by looking at the law with its commands, but by fixing our eyes on Christ as Lord so that he now lives his life through us by the Spirit, you know, teaching us to live now by that completed law summed up in the law of Christ, love for God, love for neighbor, uh, listening to his commands in the New Testament, which kind of flesh out how we live, but we're living in obedience to him, in relation to him, by the working of the Spirit through our lives and hearts. Paul says, I died to the law. How? Through the law. Now that's interesting. What does that mean? Look over at Galatians 4, 4 and 5. Of course, we'll get there eventually, but this is part of Paul fleshing things out. Galatians 4, verse 4. Paul says, but when the fullness of time had come, right, when all that Old Testament promise is playing out and leading up to the coming of Christ, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. Christ was born into this world under the law. That means he was a Jewish man under the reign of the old covenant system and subject to all of its commands and penalties, and yet he was sinless as the Son of God. And he took that sinless life and he laid it down in death for us, a death for sin, my sin, your sin, if you belong to him, so that all those penalties of the law that reigned over us in death he took upon himself. He fulfilled every purpose of every command. He satisfied the demands of every penalty. And he did that in place of his people for whom he died, including me, including Paul. And Paul says, now through that law and the penalties that fell on Christ in my place, I died to that law. 
on the day Christ died on the cross, the reign of the law over me ended as a law covenant along with all of its threats. By dying under the law in our place, he has forever ended the era of the law for us who are in him. When he kept them, he finished them. He fulfilled them in my place. He he took the law out of the way for me. How? Colossians chapter 2, verse 14. By canceling the record of death that stood against us with its legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. By dying under the law in our place, he has ended forever the era of the law for us who are in him, so that now we who have been crucified with Christ share in his victory. Uh, With death out of the way, we are now free to live for God through Christ alone, not by works of the law, as Paul says here. Why? Because I am crucified with Christ. And by the way, that statement, though we tend to read it with verse 20, is actually the end part of verse 21. Your translators didn't get it wrong. They really could have almost repeated it (laughs) because it's closely tied to what goes before and then it's closely tied to what follows after. And in the Greek text, of course, remember, verse numbers are late, right? Paul didn't write verse numbers. (laughs) But whoever wrote those original verse numbers put the verse number after that line, but that would separate the thought for us English speakers, so they tend to put that line, even though you look at a Greek text, it's in, the, it's in verse 19, that they tend to slip it down to verse 20 because it, it does make more logical sense there, except we need to know the question Paul is answering, and he's answering, how am I dead to the law? Because I am crucified with Christ. This is how I died to the law. Because I've been crucified with Christ. I died with Christ. The death of Christ on the cross, listen, that is the decisive moment of history. Everything changes there. At that moment, the old era of the law ended and believers and Christ died to the law's reign over them so that in union with Christ by faith, this has spelled death to the old covenant law keeping and brought us into the new covenant of life in Christ by faith. Real life, resurrection life, the life of Christ himself dwelling in us and through us by the power of the Holy Spirit. So that third... We now understand that the whole of our lives is now found in union with Christ, not in adherence to Old Testament law. The whole of our lives as believers is now found in union with Christ, not in adherence to Old Testament law. Verse 20, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for nothing. Hey, do you have verse 20 memorized? Let me strongly, oh, I hope so. I hope so. Let me strongly encourage you. Homeschoolers, put this on the curriculum. Um, whoever else, put this in your phone with a reminder on a three-by-five card, whatever you have to do. This is a verse you need to come back to again and again and again. I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me and the life I live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Where is your life found? It's not found in the law. It's it's not found in trying to keep the commands. Listen to me. It's not found in you trying to justify yourself. A lot of us, we're not familiar enough with the law to even try to live by it. We, We live by the Facebook post or the Instagram post or what we think our friends think about us or what we think about ourselves. Any given moment as we evaluate ourselves with this impossible standard, we think if only I can do well enough and please others well enough or please myself well enough, I'll be good, I'll be justified. No, none of that. It's not found in any of those things. It's found in Christ who lives in you through faith. But do you see the the connection he's making here? 
The verse before this says we are dead to the law and alive to God. And then the verse afterwards remind us that we can't find righteousness through the law. That's a dead end. Because if we could, then, then Christ died for nothing. But listen, Christ died for something. He died in my place. And now he lives, not just up in heaven where he reigns, though he does that, but through the Holy Spirit who now lives in me so that he lives through me. And that's what makes all the difference in the world. I died to the law by being crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. How? By going back to the law? No, by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. By faith in Christ who did more than just give me a law to live by, even a new law. No, he came to dwell within me, to live his life in and through me. I mean, this is truly amazing to be joined to Christ. This is a mystery of all mysteries. Oh, to understand this sacred reality of union with Christ, Christ living in me. That's not just a manner of speaking. This is the reality which the new covenant brings into our lives. We'll come back to some of this next week. I I think we'll just look at this one verse, verse 20. I think it's a good Easter passage. Um, But quickly notice two things about this new covenant reality of Christ in me. First, Paul says, in light of this, it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Right? That old me in Adam, that old me under the law, that old me held captive to sin, that guy died. And I no longer live in that old world of trying to restrain sin by the effort of keeping the law. I have stepped into the new reality pictured in places like Romans 6, 6, and 7, which says we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, rendered powerless, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin, for one who has died has been set free from sin. I've died with Christ. I have died with him, and now Christ is alive in me, and and, and this, this is a new self. A new self is living here in me, a new man in union with Christ. Colossians 3 verse 10 says that we have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. And so we are now living in the new life of Christ who is alive in us, and we are alive to him. And our victory over sin comes from daily walking with him, looking to him, empowered by his grace and presence, not by trying to keep the moral dictates of the law. Again, Romans 6, verse 14. For sin will have no dominion over you since... Okay, think about this. He's about to tell us why sin no longer has dominion. Sin no longer has dominion over you since you're not under law but under grace. There is a new principle at work in the life and heart of the believer, and it's called grace. That dynamic reality and power of God's presence that is alive in you because of Christ, orienting you to Christ, living through you in Christ, bringing you again and again through repentance and faith back to him that you might walk in him. So that second, Paul says, the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith. In the Son of God. Notice this. He's talking about the life you live right now in in this flesh, meaning in, in this present mortal body. And how do I live it? Not by painstaking adherence to the law, but by faith in Christ who loved me. You see, here's the picture the new life of heaven has already broken in and begun to take hold of you if you're in Christ. You have a new life, Christ's own life, alive in you as a gift. That's what's animating you. That's what's empowering you. And that's why God is not saying live up to this. He's saying, you know, so you can become what you're not. He's saying, Christian, be who you are. Live what I've made you. And so even though you are still living 
in the same old body that's been subjected to sin your whole life, nevertheless, you now have a new life dynamic, the very life of Christ, the very life of his coming kingdom alive in you that is empowering you, that is moving you forward, that is orienting you daily to him. And when we get to Galatians 5, we'll see how this works in us to restrain sin better than any series of commands ever could. Uh, Paul says in Galatians 5, 16, but I say walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Live out the work the Spirit is doing within you. Verse 18 in Galatians 5, but if you were led by the Spirit, you are not under law. This new dynamic of the Spirit's presence bearing his fruit orienting us to Christ, centering our lives around him, gives us a new kind of life the law could only point to, but could never provide. How does he do that? Well, not by orienting us back to the law, but by uniting us to Christ himself and bearing his fruit through us. Notice that. How do I live? By faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Right? The Christian's life is now a Christ-centered life, not a law-centered life. I'm pressing on to know Christ. I'm following Christ. And so faith in Christ and the new heart he gives is working in me and through me from the inside out. I'm not seeking a righteousness that can be earned by law. I am resting in a righteousness that is given by grace. I live with my eyes fixed, not on laws to be kept, but on a Christ to be treasured and followed with joy. Yes, listening to his every word, seeking to obey him as my shepherd for my good, not just a lawgiver to hem me in. So the Christian life is wholly oriented to Christ, not law. Everything now passes through the lens of Christ by faith. So I get up in the morning and it's Christ's words, not law words. It's Christ's words that fill our minds and direct our lives. We begin with him. Now there's all kinds of overlap and we'll get back to that. And the law still exists as revelation. It reveals truth about God But now it must be understood in light of Christ's work and who he is and what he's done and the promise that he has fulfilled. He must become my whole world. Why? Because he loved me and gave himself for me even when I was still in my sin. Think of that. Romans 5 eight. but God shows his love for us in this while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. He he loved me and gave himself for me. He substituted himself in my place to free me from the law's condemnation and rule. And now, now he has won my heart. Now he rules within my heart and directs me into a new life as I daily, daily walk with him. Therefore, Paul says in verse 21, I don't nullify the grace of God by turning from him, Christ, back to the law. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. And the word really pictures for nothing whatsoever. Just just threw his life away. If the law could have done it, Christ would never have come. But the law couldn't do it. It couldn't make even one soul righteous before God. It still can't, by the way. So don't go back to the law. To go back to the law as if it could bring you to God is to repudiate grace. It's to turn from grace. And later Paul will even say that some, by doing so, have fallen from grace. If the law could do it, Christ is not needed. But the law can't do it. So Christ has come. And what we need is Christ by faith alone. Christ, not works of the law. 
Christ in me, the hope of glory. And this is where you need to stop and evaluate yourself. To what are you looking to bring you to God? To what are you looking to be conformed to Christ? Are you, are you looking at the mirror? Are you looking within yourself? Are you trying to tick off the boxes? To what are you, are you, are you hoping that the law can do what it was never meant to do if you just obey it well enough? No, let your life and hope be fully fixed in Christ for the new life that he gives by grace alone through faith in those who trust in him. Friend, look to Christ. Look to Christ for salvation. Keep looking to Christ for life and godliness. Uh, keep seeing who Christ is in his word. Keep letting it show you him and the brightness of his glory. Keep listening to his, his every command, but now knowing it's the voice of a shepherd giving me, giving me direction that I might live with him and walk with him. And, and, and the more you walk with him, as we'll see in Galatians 6, uh, the less you need to worry about what fence or command you might be tripping over because as you're walking with him, uh, those things aren't even in play anymore because you have him. And as you're walking with him in the grace of his spirit and the reality of his presence, he leads you not into sin, but into fruitfulness and growing joy. So much more we need to see here. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the grace of Jesus in your word that has granted us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him. I want to pray for those who right now... Is that me? <laughs> Here, do something with that. I have no idea why it's beeping. All right. Sorry about that. Right in mid-prayer. I, I'm sitting here thinking, I wish whoever that was would wake up and do something about that. <laughs> And so I peeked to see which one of you it was. <laughs> and that little thing was flashing right there. Okay, Lord, you wanted to interject something. <laughs> Maybe just to remind us not to take ourselves too seriously. But oh God, how we take you and your words seriously and how we take Christ seriously. He is everything. He is everything. God, help us to see that. God, even now, would you convict of sin the one who is in this room struggling and trying on their own to please you, living by some list of rules and check boxes that they think will somehow make them fit to stand in your presence, but it never will and they never could. But there is Christ in all of his beautiful purity. Oh God, would you let us, as we open your word this week, see him see him in his beauty and purity. Lord, don't let anything take the shine off Christ for us. But let us see him. Repent of our sin. And trust in his full provision of everything we need. For it is in his magnificent name we pray. Amen. Please turn to hymn number 117. 117. This hymn uses the tune of Darwall, which commonly may known as, be known as uh, Rejoice the Lord is King. And this hymn is a responsive hymn. It's it's talking directly to Christ as we sing. We come, O oh Christ, to you, true Son of God and man, by whom all things consist, in whom all life began. In you alone we live and move and have our being. God. 
blood, your blood our ransom paid. In you we face our judge and make her run afraid. Before the throne, absolved we stand, your love has met your laws demand. You are the living truth, all wisdom dwells in you. The source of every skill, the one eternal true. Oh, great I am, in you we rest your answer to our every quest. You only are true life, to know you is to live. The more abundant life that earth can never give. Oh, Praise the Lord. Our, our benediction for today is from 2 Peter. And, and, and Peter comes around. Peter comes around and uh, by the Lord's Spirit writes many, many wonderful things for the church. And this is how he ends his letter. And let's, let's receive this benediction together. May we grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Amen. And you are dismissed.